Hey, hype our team. Are we all here? We are. Gang's I think we're all here. here. Yeah. Oh, everyone's here. This is great. Um, and we're all, we're all, audio is all working. And so this is, uh, so I wanted to, to welcome everyone to Hype Our Live today. Um, this is, we're trying another, another new format here uh, using, doing this on Zoom. Uh, just think it's going to be easier for people to come and join us. Um, but this is a bi-weekly live event where the Hype Our team gets a chance to share our current work, what we're thinking about, what we're working on, what we're doing on the platform. This can be work on like the core platform or our interoperability tools or some of the products we build with Hype Our, you know, for ourselves and for our customers. Um, so today we're going to talk a bit more about what we, we, we debuted this week, uh, which is Hype Our Space, uh, which is a product we built to do spatial configuration and layout of office space and beyond, right? This is not just about offices. This is about, uh, it's a, we're trying to build a tool that, that abstracts the process of conceptual and schematic layout of building spaces. Uh, I'm Tyler Goss. I'm the product manager for Hypar. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit briefly about the business applications of Hypar space. But uh, the real star of the show today is Andrew Human, uh, who has not had his design of his camera on yet, um, but, uh, he's going to walk us through the process of developing some new functionality for Hypar, uh, for the new some functionality for Hypar space. Um, and as always, like this is a live coding session. We really want this to be like a real glimpse into how we think as a team, how we work on our own product, and how we how we develop new functionality for for everyone, and how we solve design and engineering problems. Um, so it's live coding, as I said. Um, we're also recording this. This is being recorded live right now. It's actually streaming to YouTube. I don't have the link because all of my screens are occupied with, with uh, Keynote at this point, um, but I'm sure someone will post the link into the, uh, into the, to the chat here. Yeah, and Tyler, I'm just channel. noticing now the, the, um, there's a little icon at the upper left-hand corner. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see live on YouTube. And if you pull that little drop down, it gives you oh, cool. a straight bounce out. And that was the little audio thing at the beginning where you might've heard the first few seconds of our conversations because I was simultaneously looking at the stream to make sure that it was working <laughs> and listening to it here. And the stream is offset by like, five seconds. So I can, I can yep. confirm it's working on YouTube. So if you can't get in here for some reason, uh, we can, we can, you can, you can join us on YouTube. Ian, that's a, that five second delay is so we can censor you if you start, you know, saying things that are, that are really, uh, uh, uh shut the fuck up. Oh, <laughs> and there it is. Um, so, uh, Today's objectives for the for for Hyper Live, we're going to do a few things. We want to just showcase, ideally, since this is a coding session, we're going to showcase the the developer experience on Hyper uh, with what Andrew is doing. Uh, we're going to demonstrate how we can leverage uh, existing internal external content libraries. In this case, Revit content libraries. Uh, we're going to develop some code to place standard server racks and cabinets into dynamic data, like dynamically sized data halls. Uh, and we're going to generate some valuable design analytics for that, like the number of racks, the watts per square foot in the building, and so forth. Um, so the big question, I think, probably here is why data centers, and specifically in this case, edge data centers. Um, this is an emerging market that uh, you know we're we're just like we have are just starting to learn about. Um, uh, that primarily has emerged because of latency issues with customer with delivering computation or content to customers of internet services. So, so uh, the way that a lot of big companies now are solving this latency are by deploying what are called edge data centers, which are smaller data centers and compute centers that are geographically closer to their customers. So they, are, they happen inside of business districts, uh, you know, in, you know, inside of commercial areas, uh, retail areas, et cetera. Um, in in this, the, the existing fabric of the city, as opposed to what you think when I think of a data center, I, I typically think of, you know, a big, you know, enormous football field sized building out in the middle of, of nowhere, close to very, very cheap power and, and, uh, um, and, and cooling. Um, but this solves a problem for a lot of emerging, uh, uh, emerging things like the 5G network relies very heavily on edge data, edge, edge data, so do autonomous vehicles. And then obviously companies like Netflix and Disney uh, streaming content to you, they want to have that content loaded and cached close to you so that you can get it faster. Um, all of this has led to the fact that we're, we're about, in, in this calendar year, we're going to see about $7.6 billion in construction of edge data centers. Uh, and around 880 million of that is going to be design and engineering cost. Actually, how do you how do you design and engineer and deploy these things? 
Um, what's really awesome for, for us as a computational and generative platform is that this is a very deterministic design process. It's governed by the rules of physics and the rule and 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 the you know in terms of heat rejection uh, from these hot servers, and it's governed uh, by also by circulation. How do you move through the space? So it's the very there are some very simple rules for laying out data halls, which make it really pliant to how Hypar works as a platform. Um, and it's also, you know, from a perspective as a lot of us here at Hypar are architects or recovering architects. And, and it's an interesting problem, uh, I think, of adaptive reuse. I think especially as we go, as we're in this post-COVID era, during the post-COVID era, uh, not everyone's going to go back to the office. They're going to be empty office space. This is a great um, potential use of that office space is to place data and compute close to people who are in, who are still working in central business districts, districts or adjacent to central business districts. Um, one final caveat before I hand this over to Andrew, we are not data center experts. Um, we are just learning about this, this sector. We're really, we're, we're trying to uh, sort of understand the rules that govern how these buildings are built and laid out and what the components of the building are programmatically, et cetera. If you are a data center expert and you are in our audience today, please raise your hand, please comment. If you see anything that's egregiously wrong with what we're doing, um, this is gonna be a very simple uh, 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 function that we lay out. Uh, and it's probably not, it's, you know, it's going to look like a toy to some people. Um, but the, the, the cool thing about it is this is the simplest it will ever be. Once we have built this, we can expand on it. We can capture all of the edge cases and all of the really other ways that we can add complexity to this to make this a real robust tool. Um, with that, I want to hand it over to Andrew Human, who one of our lead developers, who's actually the lead developer of Hype Our Space, uh, which debuted this week. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so uh, as uh, as Tyler mentioned, this is going to be a live coding session. Um, I'm going to go pretty fast. I've got 50 minutes to build a, a whole Hypar function, but I'm going to talk through the whole process. Um, let me get my screen up here. Um, so as Tyler mentioned, um, we're building off of the recent release of a tool called Hypar Space, which is sort of a collection of functionality in Hypar that does in a sort of simple way, a sort of high level layout of a floor, defining these colored blocks or zones, and then some additional functions which fill in those zones with detailed furniture arrangements. So what we're gonna be doing today is actually create a new space type that can plug into this workflow so that we can take maybe one of these zones and assign it to be a data hall. Um, and in the process, this will also show a little bit about kind of how this thing is structured and how we're thinking about it. Um, and so I think, you know, even if maybe data holes are not your area of interest, it should provide some insight into how the logic of this system is set up in the first place. So what I want to do is create a new Hypar function. Um, I'm going to be building this function in C Sharp, um, but I'm going to start using the wizard on Hypar. So when you are logged into your Hypar account, there is a new function button, and there are various ways we can author functions on Hypar. Um, I am going to create one in C Sharp, and this wizard will help me get set up. It'll sort of guide me through the process. So I'm going to say uh, create one called data hall, um, and it's going to you you know, lay out a data hall. And then I'm going to establish what I want the inputs to this function to be. So I've got a handful of inputs that are going to drive the logic of this function. Hopefully, I'll have time to hook into all of them. Some of them may or may not uh, ultimately affect it. But we'll, uh, I'll also share a kind of finished example code um, at the end of this that, that everyone can refer to if you want to see in more depth. So the things that are going to control this, first of all, there are a few different data racks I can choose from, and I want some parameters that will let me pick which data rack I want to use. So, and I was just starting with a Revit family that we downloaded that has a few different options. So uh, there's a 1000 millimeter depth option and there's a 1200 millimeter depth option. So I'm just setting up the options that will show up in this dropdown. Um, and this is going to define the cabinet depth. Um, then I'm going to do the same thing for the cabinet height, and I'm going to define some preset options. There's a 42U, which is about 2013 millimeters. 
There's a 45U, which is 21, 46 millimeters. And there is a 48U, which is 22, 80 millimeters. Um, and again, I'll hit done configuring. I'll pick what I want my default option to be. The choice I make here specifies that default. And I'll give it a name of cabinet height. Next, I wanna specify the kilowatts per rack. And I'm gonna do that with just a range, a sort of numerical slider. So I'll say this is gonna be kilowatts per rack. And I wanna set a sensible minimum of maybe five and a maximum of about 30. And again, if these numbers seem wrong to you, we are not data center experts. Uh, we uh, uh, are just gonna, you know, use a guess here, but obviously all of these values can be adjusted. I can click preview over here to kind of see what this interface is gonna look like as well as to set a default. So I'm gonna set a default of around 10, something like that. Um, and then I'm gonna drop in two more parameters. I need a hot aisle width and a cold aisle width, which will control the spacing between these data racks. So this one is also going to be a range. I'm gonna call it hot aisle width, and I'm going to set its minimum to be zero and its maximum to be four. These values are in meters, and I have to specify that this represents a length so that it shows up with meters here. And I'll set the default here to be around one. I also want a little bit more fine-grained control, so we'll set that to be a step of uh, 0.01, and we'll do one more of these, and then we'll be ready to move on. Cold aisle width will look a lot like this one. It'll have a minimum of zero, a, a step of 0 0.01, a maximum of four, a unit type of length, and I'll set its default to be like 1.2, maybe, something like that. So I've now configured the inputs to my function. This is what the interface to my function will look like, and I can move ahead and continue configuring. So I need to set up some outputs as well. These are data readouts that are gonna come out of my function. So, uh, and I also need to set up some model dependencies. So this function is going to use the space boundaries that were produced by a different function. So I need to specify that it has a dependency on these space planning zones that are created. Um, and I also need to point it to the data type of those zones. So those space planning zones are of a type called space boundary. And so I need a reference to that type so that when I create the project, it has all of the right classes. Um, we sort of automatically generate those classes from these references. Andrew, it's also it's also worth pointing out at this point, and we we, we point out we point this out in some way in all of these hypar lives. But the reason that he's able to do that to say that I have this specific type called a space planning zone, and here's the schema for that and everything else, is that this whole thing is underpinned by this this technology that you hear us tweet about and everything else um, called elements, which you know if you're familiar with the Revit API or other um, uh, building ontologies like IFC. One of the challenges you always run into with those is that um, you know you have this uh, this uh, server rack. Where does the server rack go in one of those ontologies? Is it furniture? Is it generic? Is it IFC building proxy object? It's oftentimes hard to fit the kinds of things that you need into those ontologies. And so Hypar gives you this flexibility to actually define your own types, and then those types become first class citizens uh, in the system, and you're able to pass around data of those types. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a couple more uh, outputs here. We want to specify the rack count, and we also want to calculate the watts per square feet. Uh, so this one, I'll just say, is watts per square foot. And that I'm doing this as a string because we don't have a unit type that represents power at the moment, but I can just format a string that will show the correct units. And all of this configuration is now done. Um, I can click publish function, which will establish the function on Hypar and also provide me with this little link or this little piece of text that I can paste into my, uh, into my terminal so that I can automatically spin up a Hypar project. So I'm gonna click this to copy that onto the clipboard and then I'm going to pull up a terminal. And I already have the Hypar command line tools installed. If you're doing this for the first time, there are a few things you'll need to install, which I'll point out are just documented. If you go to the Hypar, whoops, uh, actually, I think that should be safe. If you go to the Hypar menu uh, and click developer docs, there's a bunch of guidance about you know, how you would do this. I'm obviously going fast. Uh, you're not expected to follow along. Um, so I'm already in my sort of repositories folder on my machine. 
I can paste that command that I just created. Um, and what it's going to do is spin up a whole C sharp project, which will uh, take into account all of the choices I just made when configuring and generate some code, generate some classes, basically build a skeleton of the function that I have set up. Um, so that all I have to do is fill in the logic for how this function should actually take those inputs and produce a layout. Yeah, Andrew, I'm, I'm thinking about this now that I, I see you go through this. What happens after we create a function through the UI? Does it actually, you, you'll, you're able to search for it on Hypar and you're able to add it to a workflow, I think, but it does, does it do nothing? I think it just does uh, nothing, right? So it has no brain. If you, if you do this, it will give you a warning. And actually, I think this is the this is a different version of that. This was the version that I was practicing with. But if I try and add data hall to my workflow, um, it will just warn me that there's no logic for this. The other thing is that when you create a function for the first time, um, it's only visible to you, the author. So no logic was found for this function. And so we'll get we'll guide you towards how you can actually supply Got it. the logic Got for it. this. Cool. So, okay, this is just about done. Um, and once it's done, I'm gonna fire up Visual Studio Code. Um, so it's created a directory called Data Hall. So I'm gonna use a shortcut to open Visual Studio Code and open Data Hall with Visual Studio Code. And that should pop up the project that we've just created. And this window is- The question we always get at this point after these presentations is, I saw you guys doing all this stuff in Visual Studio Code, but I only use Visual Studio. Can I still do this? And the answer is yes. yes. The, the, this is just what you're going to see here is basically it's just a .NET core project. If you're using Visual Studio, even the freemium sort of ver community version of that thing, uh, it will work. There are slight, slight little alterations to workflows that you need to do, but we have people on our team who use both. Um, the demos are just happening in VS Code. Yeah. Um, so. I need to do a few other little setup things in order to get this ready to run. Um, and one of those is uh, I need to, I'm going to use some functions that are still in the alpha builds of our libraries. Um, so I'm just going to say hypar update. And I'm going to use this sort of funny syntax to say update with just the latest version of whatever alpha builds of our libraries are available. Um, and this will go through all of the projects in this configuration and replace them with a sort of pointer to whatever is the latest and greatest. Um, I don't generally recommend you do this because things can sort of change out from under you. Um, but for the since I know what all these alphas are and what their status is, I feel pretty comfortable doing this right now. Well, at, at the same time, it's worth saying. Um, if you if you connect with us on Discord, if you get started developing on Hypar and you run into trouble, you know nine times out of ten, some developer from the Hypar team is going to engage with you and fix a problem and say, "Hey, go use this alpha version of the thing because I just fixed the problem for you like in real time." You know, because some of these libraries that underpin what Hypar is doing are still in the relatively early days; they're sort of fast and evolving. So Andrew's just showing off some functionality that's in one of the alpha builds, but just hasn't been mainstreamed into a into a proper point release yet. The other thing that I need to do to set this up is I need to reference the content catalog, which contains some server rack content that we exported from Reddit families. And right now, this is something that uh, Hyper users can't do. We still have to handle all of the exporting and creating, um, but you are welcome to use any of the content catalogs that we produce. They're just JSON files that live at a location. They're a little bit inscrutable, um, but all I really need is this URL. And I can say Hyper generate catalog dash U and then paste that URL. And so this is the URL to that catalog. It's going to do one more piece of automatic code generation and produce this data rack.g.cs class, which contains a pointer to all of the different content elements that we exported from Revit in this case. So this says, this is what this family is. This is how big it is. I have information about its size. I have information about any of the parameters that were set on it in Revit. And then I can just reference this class in my own code and create instances of these families. The nice thing about this is that if I ever export from Hypar into a Revit model that has these families loaded, I can actually reinstantiate the original native Revit family content based on this. And it'll look and be positioned exactly the same as it was in Hypar. So we're pretty excited about this capability. Okay. So, so far I haven't written any code. Let's change that. 
um, I am going to actually fill out the body of this method, execute, which is sort of like the basis of every hyper function. This is what runs when a hyper function runs. Um, and what I'm going to do is take in the boundary that I want to fill with a data hall. Um, and I'm going to do some sort of geometric work in order to populate it with the right kinds of content in the right arrangement. Um, so what I'm going to do is set up a test workflow, a workflow that I can use to just kind of play around with this. So I'm going to go back to my hypar window, say new workflow. Uh, and actually, I think I'll just use the new hypar space template. So this template will set you up with all of the functions for our hypar space product. Um, take a second to load them in, but this will sort of give you an arrangement that's already configured to uh, lay out some stuff. The only thing that's missing um, is actually drawing some floor plate. So I'm going to go to floors by sketch and I'm going to draw a floor. This could also be something that I import via DXF. And this will, as soon as I do this, all the rest of these functions will kick in. It'll generate a kind of corridor arrangement and some spatial zones. Oh, that's interesting. I probably have some like leftover points somewhere in here. Uh, let's see. Let's just, that's a new one on me, actually. I haven't seen that. Uh, let's try, this is, the, this is the beauty of the live demo. If I just resize this guy, it's a little big in any case. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll avoid our- I think, I think you might have your OMA Rem Coolhouse filter on. Yeah, exactly. There we go. That's a little more reasonable. Um, and so by default, this is just going to assume that everything wants to be open office. Um, but I don't want everything to be open office. In fact, I would like this room, let's say, to be a data hall. And I can do this by saying edit program assignments and assign it the data hall program. And there's a drop down menu, and I added data hall as one of the preset options. But if you want to define your own space types, you can actually type anything in here. You can type wombat room and it will work. And then as long as your function is looking for things called wombat room, you'll be fine. But I'm going to make this data hall and hit save, and it should change color. And I won't get any furniture in it because there is no function in this workflow that's trying to lay out a data hall. But we're going to fix that. So this is designated as a data hall. I can see this area is designated for data hall. And I'm going to test my local function, even though I haven't written anything yet. I'm going to go to my menu, test a local function, grab another command that I'm going to run in my terminal. And I'm going to use the little integrated terminal in VS Code to run this. And what it's going to do is build my local function and serve it up in such a way that the Hypar web interface can actually interact with it. Um, and this is, a, this is the way that I tend to build and debug. Um, I like to just sort of make changes and have them automatically reflected in the web UI so I can see exactly how it's going to interact with other functions. Um, so once I see a little green ID down at the bottom here, um, I should be able to return to the Hypar web UI and pull this in. Um, there we go. I can click ready. And now it's going to add an instance of this function that I just set up. And it's actually, this dashed line tells me that it's running locally on my machine. So it's communicating with the local version of the function. And if I make changes here, it's actually going to re-execute that built copy of the function. So we're not doing anything very exciting yet. Um, one of the things I need to do is retrieve this volume, this thing, which is a space boundary object. Um, and that space boundary is being output from the space planning zones function, which in its connections produces space planning zones. You'll remember that earlier we set up a dependency on space planning zones. So I'm just going to say right up here, um, var space planning zones equals, let's get our caps right, input models space planning zones. So this dictionary contains all of the dependencies that I've specified for my function. Next, I'm going to say the rooms are all of the elements in this uh, model that are of type space boundary. So I'll say var rooms equals space planning zones dot all elements of type space boundary. And uh, I also only want to consider the rooms 
that have a name of data hall. So this uh, function, space planning zones, is outputting a series of these space boundary elements, and their name is dictated by whatever program I assign. So I want just the one whose name is equal to data hall. So for that, I'm going to use link and do a where filter. I'll need to add a reference to link, and I'll say where sb sb.name equals equals data hall. And so now this rooms is going to be the list of all of the space boundaries in the space planning zones collection that are called data hall. OK, now we can do something to those rooms. We can actually take the geometry of those rooms and produce some new geometry of our own. So I'm going to loop over all of the rooms. There might be multiple data holes in this project. So I'll say for each var room in rooms. And I think probably the simplest thing to do at this moment um, is just to create like a really dumb grid on the bottom of the room. Um, so each room is going to have a boundary. Uh, so I'm going to say var boundary equals room dot boundary. And this is an object of type profile, I believe. Um, and so I can use this profile to create a grid. So let me see here. So what I want to do is create a new grid. And I'm going to use a, a class in elements called grid2d to do this. So I'll say var grid equals new grid2d. I'm going to need to add a reference to the elements.spatial namespace. And I'm going to create it from the boundary dot perimeter, just the sort of outer edge of that room. And then what I want to do is visualize it in Hypar. So far, we haven't really seen anything show up here. So I just want to do a gut check and make sure that everything is working. So I'll say, I also need to create a model that I can output. So I'll say var model equals new model. And then I need to attach that model to the object that this method returns. So output.model equals model. And now I can add elements to that model, and they'll show up in Hypar. So what I want to do is model.add elements. And I'm just going to use grid dot to model curves as a quick way to visualize this. A grid is sort of an abstract thing, but I can turn it into some curves if I want to see what it actually looks like in Hypar. So once I let that run, we should actually finally see some geometry. It's pretty hidden here, but if I go to isolate, we have produced this very exciting rectangle. Um, but the power of a grid is that I can do things like subdivide it. So I can say grid.u.divide by count 10, and now I should see 10 subdivisions show up in my grid. And I can say grid.v.divide by pattern, and I'll say, let's make this a new pattern of, let's go two and four, uh, let's say. And let's see, it just wants a new list. Oh, it's because they're not doubles, I think. There we go. And so now it's going to create a repeating pattern in the opposite direction of two and four. Um, those are a little big, so we can't see the pattern, but that is what it's doing. So. Now, what I want to do is sort of tune the grid that I'm creating to something a little bit more realistic for my content. And for that, I'm also going to want to take into account the size of the content elements that I've got. So as I mentioned before, we have generated this class, this data rack class, which contains a bunch of these content elements. And I can add them to the model too. In fact, I'm going to add one just temporarily, just so we can see what it looks like. So I'll say var rack equals uh, data rack dot. And then I can pick any one of these. And these different designations, 81, 82, those correspond to the inputs that I set up earlier. But I'm just going to pick one at random for now. And now I've got a reference to that. And if I want to create an instance of it, I'll say, var instance equals rack dot create instance. And then I need to give it a transform. I, I I want, just, while Andrew is doing this, I want to point something out. For those of you in the audience who might have come, for instance, from a, a background of Revit family or, or Revit development against the Revit API, you know, a number of us on the team come from that same background. And when we were building these APIs, 
you know, we wanted to make it more direct to get to the things you need. So for instance, when he went and got the boundary of a room earlier, just by saying like room.boundary, if you think about how difficult that same operation is via the Revit API, just to get the outline of the room, similarly placing a family instance, you got to figure out the family instances in the document, you got to get its ID, you got to jump through all these hoops. By generating some of this code that references these content elements, it's as simple as what Andrew is showing here. You just say, you know, data rack dot, and then the name of the, the, you know, the SKU for that particular content element. And then you create an instance of the thing and you're done, like two lines of code. That's a really good point. Um, and in fact, you can see that that has worked. I have now created an instance of this little data rack here. Um, and right now it's located at the origin um, because I created an instance of it with a sort of a basic default transform, which is located at the origin. Um, but what I want to do is place that according to the grid. Um, the other information that this gives me um, is the size of this object. So I want to take into account the width and the depth of this rack so that I can use that as a parameter in the grid that I establish. Um, so I've picked out my rack. Um, what I want to do is get its width, which in this case, the instance is going to have a a bounding box that I can use to calculate its dimensions. So var width is going to be equal to rack.boundingbox.max.x minus rack.boundingbox.min.x. And you can probably guess what depth will be. I'll just replace my x's with my y's. So we'll do a little bit of that. And so now I've got useful information that I can use to lay things out. So if I think about the way that I want to lay this out, I think that the, uh, the kind of spacing along this short axis wants to correspond to the, wants to correspond to the depth, I think. Um, I, that may prove to be wrong, but we'll, we'll play around with it a little bit. So instead of doing this divide by pattern, um, I think what I'm going to do is divide by a fixed length. And I'm going to use my depth as, actually I'm gonna use the width. No, it should be the width as the driver of that subdivision. So now whatever this dimension is going this way, that is how big my grid is running this way. Now, the positioning and sizing along the other axis is a little more complicated. I also don't want to lay this thing wall to wall with data racks. I want to have like a little bit of a, an aisle around the outside. Um, and I also want aisles in between that alternate the hot width and the cold width, typically these, these data halls. In fact, I have a diagram of it that Tyler provided me with, um, which is basically just the idea that uh, you're taking your racks and there's a sort of cold aisle and then a hot aisle for ventilation. And the, they sort of alternate in this pattern, but they're, the racks are sort of facing the cold aisle in all cases. So I'm gonna try and mimic something like that. Um, so first things first, I'm gonna wanna create that sort of offset. That's the other thing we have a diagram we can show real quick. Like I basically, I wanna make sure that there's space around all of these aisles. Um, and so I'm just gonna use a gut uh, on a, a sort of a gut check on the sizing here. So instead of creating my grid from the boundary perimeter, um, I'm actually going to create an inset. So I'll say var inset equals uh, room dot boundary dot perimeter dot offset by negative 1.2. And now I'm going to create my grid from that inset instead. And we should see this actually sort of scooch inwards. And that'll be relative to if I turn the private office layout back on uh, as like, as context, maybe, Sh whoops, show as context. We'll see it sort of faded out. And I'm going to actually get rid of all of these other things in here because we're not really using them. Um, so we don't need a lounge. We don't need a meeting room. Um, so, and let's just see, oh, I bet I have a floor, which is obscuring my view of that grid. There we go. Okay. So now I can see that this is actually inset by a certain amount. And 
What I would like to do is create this pattern where the racks are, they're sort of alternating between hot aisle rack facing forward, cold aisle rack facing backward, uh, and so on. Um, and so the Grid2D API exposes a useful method, which I briefly showed earlier, um, called divide by pattern. Um, and what I'm going to do is divide by pattern. And there are a couple overloads of this. One that just takes a list of doubles. So what are the sizes you want to repeat? And another, which is actually more useful, which allows me to supply a list of names and sizes, which I'm going to rely on to know what sort of a grid cell I'm dealing with. So in this case, what I want is a new list of these little tuples or sort of combined data, each of which has a string for the name and then a double for the length. So I want to start with the forward rack. I'm going to start with a rack since we already have an aisle around the outside. And I'm going to make that the depth, which we already calculated, the size of the rack. And then I'm going to do a hot aisle which will use the value that we set on that input called hot aisle. And this is something I want to pause on for a second. Um, when we went to all that trouble of configuring stuff in the web UI, it automatically created this inputs class that has all of those inputs as properties. So when I specified that there should be a slider called hot aisle width, it made me a class that has a hot aisle width property on it. So I can just access that value like any other object. So let's just finish fleshing this out. We need a backward rack, which will also be of size depth, and then a cold aisle that is of size input dot cold aisle. And I believe that should be sufficient. Let's see what we get. We should start to see a repeating pattern along the long axis. And it's hard to tell. But this is actually being driven. If I made the hot aisle really large, we should see very fat hot aisles in between rack size, cold aisle size, rack size, and so on. Um, the other thing I'm going to want to do is uh, I want to kind of visualize this and make sure that everything is working the way I expect it to. Um, so I'm going to create some color-coded panels that will just highlight which are the hot aisles and which are the cold aisles. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get each of the grid cells. So this grid 2D produces a list of these cell objects. So I can say for each or cell in grid .get cells. And the cell may have a type associated with it. Um, and uh, so what I want to do is check if it has that type and say if cell.type equals equals hot aisle, then we're going to add a panel. Now, I also want the, the boundary of this cell. So I'm going to scooch back out here and say uh, var cell rect, the sort of rectangle that bounds this cell, is equal to cell dot get cell geometry, which is a curve. But in this case, I know it's always going to be a polygon. So I can cast it to a polygon. And I'm going to add here a new panel that uses that cell rect as its boundary. And I'm going to use built-in materials.x axis, which just happens to be red, which seems like a reasonable color to use. Um, and let's just leave it at that for now. And we should start to see the hot aisles colored in red if I did my job right. So there they are. Uh, let's do the same thing with the cold aisle. Um, I'm going to make this an, oh, go ahead. One second, and, well, Andrew, keep doing that. Uh, but while you're cranking through the various cases there, I just want to point out, you know, um, even for those of you who are, who are not into writing code and might be watching this thing and thinking, oh, this is kind of crazy and confusing. I want to point out that the grid 2D API is actually one of the first things that Andrew worked on when he was here. And it came out of conversations about what are the things that people do in Grasshopper and Dynamo right now that take up an enormous amount of space 
for relative, relatively small amount of functionality, just like making a grid with a certain pattern and then being able to address into that grid. If you were in Grasshopper, this would be like some 500 node thing with ifs and data trees and everything else. If you were in Dynamo, this would be something crazy with replication guides and all this craziness. You know, one of the things that Hypar is trying to do with all of these APIs that we add into Elements is find those things that are critical to our industry, the things that we find ourselves doing over and over and over again. And in architecture, grids, we make grids all the time. And so we can provide you a really high level API that gives you a huge amount of capability in just a few lines of code. The one other thing I'm gonna add here is a second floor. Um, and I'm gonna do this to demonstrate something. Um, so, and let's just make sure that we generate our levels at the top. Um, so right now I've been working pretty much in 2D, um, but if I had spaces at a higher elevation and let's actually just go ahead and make one of these a, another data hall, we're gonna have a problem because those things are still gonna be generated at the ground level. Um, so, oh, and I'm going to have to do one other thing, which is I have to save this to cause it to recompile so that we get that result. Um, but you can see that even though I drew this space up top, it's generating the grid down at the bottom. So I'm going to have to do one additional thing in order to get this to show up in the right place. And that is, I'm just going to pass along the transform that was attached to this room when I create these panels. And you're going to see me do this a lot. Um, basically, uh, the room is generated also at the ground level, um, but it has a transform associated with it, which tells it how high up to be. And when I do this, it should just take on whatever transform that other thing had. And I would have to do the same for this grid as well. Um, so when I do to model curves, I should be able to provide a transform, which is the room dot transform. So that should handle causing that thing to show up at the right elevation. And so now let's go ahead and see if we can just get a rudimentary version of getting our data racks, which right now I'm just creating a single one at the origin. Let's see if we can get them to show up somewhere on our grid. So I'm actually gonna get rid of the instance that I created because we don't want one there at the origin, um, but I'm gonna do something similar in order to create it. Um, and I'm going to do uh, one other check here. So let's just, there are a few more cases. We already covered the hot aisle and the cold aisle, but now I have to check for forward rack and backward rack. So I'm going to say else if, whoops, what did I do there? Else if cell.type equals equals forward rack, then we're going to add a a uh, new version of that rack at, let's just say for now, the centroid of the cell. So I'm going to say var centroid equals cell rect dot centroid. And I'm going to create a new rack instance, which is equal to my rack, which I specified earlier, dot create instance. And I'm going to, for now, just create a new transform, which is the centroid. So say, move it to that centroid. And I have to give it a name. So I'll just call it rack for now. Let's see if that works. We should start to see something. Let's see. Oh, and I have to, I have to add it to the model. So model.add element rack instance. Now we should see. The other thing is by using these instances, this can actually be like quite fast. It's sort of optimized for display of these repeated objects. So we're sort of there. Um, it's again, it's at the ground level and they're oriented wrong, but we're about to fix that. So I'm going to create a more complex transform. So I'll say var transform is equal to for now, just positioning it at the centroid. But I'm also going to append or concatenate the room transform in order to get it up to the right elevation. So I'm going to say new transform dot centroid dot concatenated uh, with the room transform. So this is going to join those two transforms together. 
And I'm also going to want to rotate it. You can see right now the doors are facing kind of 90 degrees away from where I want them. Um, so I'm going to append yet another transform here. Um, and so let's actually do that here at the beginning. New transform, new vector three, and I'll set the rotation to be 90. I don't know if it's going to be 90 or negative 90. We're going to find out. And I'm going to do concatenate it on this as well. Uh, so I'm probably missing one, uh, one parenthesis, and that looks good. Let's see if we get it facing the right way. So there's a subtle shape thing in these racks where they, their curved edge is meant to be facing the pole dial. So in fact, I want to rotate the opposite way. And once this finishes, now the curved edge is facing the cold aisle. We have one weird thing happening, which is that we seem to be getting like a little bit of an extra or an overhang. And that's because some of our grid cells are not complete. So what I'm going to do is filter this and say, only do this if the area of this cell rectangle is basically the same as with time step, if we have like a complete cell. So if the cell type equals forward rack and the cell rect area is basically equal to width times depth, and I'll give it, I don't know, a little bit of tolerance, then we should only wind up with, yeah, now see that little end condition where it wasn't going to fit. Now it only places whole racks. And so I can pretty much copy this code for the one going the other way. So I'm going to do that. And I'll say if this is a backward rack, then we're going to rotate by positive 90 instead of negative 90. And we should get our racks going the other way. I'd like to point go. out also, Andrew, while you're doing this, it might not be clear to people what's going on as Andrew edits the code and then you see the changes in real time. Um, but this is actually really cool. If you um, get started developing on Hypar, uh, and you use the command line tools like Andrew has shown, and you hook up your um, version of your function, your locally executing version of your function while you're developing, what's actually going on under the hood is every time he makes a change to the code, it's compiling on the fly and registering that as available with Hypar. And then Hypar is actually executing that thing as if it were a function that was right in your workflow running in the cloud. So all you see right now has only been executing um, has only been executing locally. And towards the end of the demo, I'm sure Andrew will show us how he pushes that up to the cloud and then it can run uh, fully on Hypar. So this has worked really well for this one, uh, but I'm running into some trouble for this one that goes the other way because it has not realized that actually it should be oriented this way for one running this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the longest edge of the boundary. So we're going all the way back up when we grabbed our boundary geometry. Um, and I'm going to just grab the longest edge from this inset, I think is probably going to work. So I'll save our longest edge is equal to, and here I'm going to use a little bit of, uh, of link to just make this compressed. But basically what I'm doing is uh, grab all of the segments of this uh, polygon. So I'll say s dot segments. And then I'm going to order them by, uh, and in fact, uh, yeah, I'll order them by their length. So l dot length. Uh, and then I'm going to get the last one because they are ordered in ascending order. Um, and we'll do, let's see, did I, let's see. Oh, because I want length as a method, not as a value. And then we'll do dot last. So this is now the longest edge of whatever given boundary. Um, and I'm going to construct a new transform, which I'll call alignment, which is going to be equal to, uh, let's see, we'll just do a new transform with the origin. And we're going to use the longest edges direction to guide how big it should be. And then we'll also set the Z axis so that we construct our transform correctly. And this also wants to be a method. And so this is going to be an alignment transform, which the grid constructor can take in order to figure out how to orient its geometry. So this will 
partially work, I suspect. So pretty good, except we still have our racks pointing the wrong way on just this one. Um, but they're pointing the right way on this one. So I'm going to need to make one more change to this crazy concatenated transform. Um, I'm going to take the alignment and I'm going to concatenate that with this whole set of other transforms. And I'm going to have to do it twice. So we'll say equals alignment dot concatenated. And this is just chaining all of these various transforms together. And, and we understand when people are watching this, even if you write code, the idea of transforms that is like coordinate systems and, and adding them together through concatenation is a confusing concept um, if you're coming at this from a kind of an architectural basis. So we are going to be adding uh, APIs to make this kind of more sensible over time. Yeah, coming from a grasshopper background, I'm really used to thinking about term, things in terms of coordinate frames or planes instead of transforms. I've gotten really used to transforms and I actually really like them because they're super powerful, but they're harder to explain and, and they can definitely be a little counterintuitive to work with. You have to be really conscious of what order you string them together and so on and so forth. So this is looking pretty good to me. I mean, again, I'm no expert in data halls, um, but it does seem to be working more or less as we intended. Um, I want to pivot to producing some of those data outputs. Um, we had established that we wanted this thing to produce a rack count and watts per square foot, but we haven't actually provided that information. So what we'll do is the rack count should actually be pretty easy to calculate. Um, we'll say var rack count is going to be equal to, and remember, we have this model that we're putting all of our elements into. Every time we create a rack, we're, we're putting an element instance into that model. So I can just say model dot all elements of type element instance dot count. And this should be the count of all of the element instances that have been dropped in. So that's one piece of information. And then I'm going to have to do a little bit of math in order to calculate the density. But for now, I'm just going to put in the rack count and I'm going to put in a dummy number for the watts per square foot. So we'll say rack count is one value and then I'll say uh, uncalculated. And this general idea is, I think, really important on Hypar, uh, just largely, that we, we want you to be able to output not just stuff that goes into the model, but metrics and values that you care about. So I can also even you know, publish this as a little customized widget, and I can put it up on my dashboard and say, OK, I really care about achieving a certain wattage per square foot or a certain rack count. And I can play with the different parameters that control that. Um, so let's see. Um, there are a few more things that I sort of had planned to do for this function. Obviously, we don't have a ton of time. One of those is drive the selection of the rack with these parameters. Right now, we're just using one. Um, Another would be to actually calculate that total density. Um, and then another will be to actually like publish this and make it available on Hypar. Um, it feels to me like the last one is maybe the most important. And I'll share code at the end that shows how to do all of those other things. Um, but if any of the other panelists have, a, have an opinion about uh, one, last, one last feature, I can, uh, I can drop in in this example. I'm all ears. One thing publish I was with Hypar. <laughs> Push it to high par. But I also want to see, yeah, Andrew, actually, can you prove that the hot aisle width and cold aisle width actually, you proved it earlier when you were laying out the panels. If you change those right now, what happens? So if I make the hot aisle width, let's make it bigger. Uh, I assume smaller is probably a bad idea. So that has affected my rack count. It has definitely made that aisle bigger. Uh, and these things are now driving those parameters directly. And I can make something really preposterous, uh, but it does seem to be fairly responsive. Nice. Now push it to high bar. Now I'll push it to high bar. So I'm still in this sort of run loop where it's constantly building and recompiling. I'm going to exit out of that by using control C. And then I'm going to use one more uh, high bar command from our sort of high bar command line to publish this to high bar so we can use it live. So I'll say high bar publish. And I'm already logged in with my account. If you're not, uh, if you haven't been using high bar much, then it might ask you to log in. Um, but uh, it's now going to take all of that, compile it into a package, 
upload it to Hypar and then make it still only available to me. Um, but if I want to share it with the world, um, I will show you how to do that once this is up and running. The other thing we'll see is that now that I have exited out of that live run, if I reload this window, that data hall function in my workflow will go away because it was sort of a virtual function to begin with. It was just a connection to my desktop, but it's not actually included in this workflow. And so once this is finished publishing, which it looks like it is, uh, I should be able to add it. And it should do everything it was just doing. It should calculate, it should lay out the geometry, it should create those instances, it should give me my live preview. I can even reconnect this widget to that instance so that it displays the right value. Um, and I can make it public. So I can say about edit, and these are some of these controls are available only to me as the sort of creator of this function. Um, but I'll go to permissions and say, I can share it with just my colleagues using an email address or a domain. I can share it with everybody at hypar.io, um, but I'm just gonna go ahead and make it public. And now anybody using Hypar can find this function. It will show up for them in their function library and they can plug it into their workflows in case they really wanted to add a data hall to their office. And so, you know, I can even do that here if I, if I wanted to, sort of run this imaginary scenario of, you know, dropping in uh, an edge data center into my, you know, unused office space or something like that. I can do that by going to space planning zones, specifying that I want this to be a data hole, and then making sure that I have that data hole function present. And actually, I'm going to use the finished version of this just to show you. Um, oh, it looks like maybe I already had it. Oh, I think I already had it, that's why. Um, so uh, this one actually does take into account the kilowatts per rack. Oh no, this is the old version, isn't it? Let's try adding the other one. So this should be the one that actually calculates all that stuff. And so it's also calculating the watts per square feet, which I could use as, as live feedback here. And you know, if anyone, if we have any data center experts or or uh, on the call, I'm sure they'll they'll tell me why uh, why this number doesn't seem realistic, or maybe it does. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I can tweak this. I can tweak the uh, choices about the kilowatts per rack assumptions. I can choose between different types of families and have those show up. So it's hard to see, but that's actually changing the size or the depth of these, and that will affect things like the count. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, I think we're, we're just about out of time, but I think the Hypar crew can maybe hang around for another couple minutes in case there are questions. Tyler, how does it work? Can we open up to questions? We've seen a couple things come through on the chat. Yeah, the, the questions, uh, so questions and answers are open. If you, there's a QA and a button at the bottom if you wanna ask a specific question. Um, but there's also the chat, and if you want to, to you know, just just poke it, poke in the chat and um, and ask questions there. Uh, you know the, the the really cool thing here is like I think you know as we we were looking at the um, from a business perspective, uh, 300 watts from my research, my very rudimentary research over the past week, uh, 300 watts is good for an edge data center. Um, it has there are certain uh, physical requirements and physical limitations uh, that you know you can go up to. A kilowatt, maybe maybe a bit more than a kilowatt per square foot in a centralized data center that's liquid cooled. Um, some of the, the larger providers like Google and and Facebook are doing. Um, but you know, this I'm really happy that this came to, came to a place that was, you know, plausible and believable at a schematic level, and and done just you know in in in, in a couple of uh, an hour of work, which is really awesome. It was a speedy hour, but uh, but yeah, we got we got yeah. most of the most of the key we, parts working. We don't expect everyone on this call <laughs> to work as quickly as Andrew Human, but imagine. Yeah. I mean, one of the cool things that this workflow gives is we've talked to a lot of people, and we've started to talk to people in data center design land, 
And a lot of this stuff is done right now on spreadsheets, right? Everybody has an Excel spreadsheet that says, if I had a data hall that was kind of this big, if I could fit this much compute in it, this is what the square footage, um, the watts per square foot would be. Um, the nice added layer on top of that is that Hypar enables you to have this spatial component now. And a lot of the stuff that Andrew did in there around like wiring up um, specific components to show up like the actual server rack uh, or, or server enclosure, the rack enclosure components that he put in there. Um, you know, we're going to make that stuff, I suspect we'll make even that stuff easier and easier and easier to code over time. So the one thing that he talked about is that we have several controls in that UI that when you toggle one of the controls internally, all it does is say like, if this value is this, select this rack. If it's this other value, select this other rack. So one optimization I could see us doing is binding together inputs to say, you know, if, if this value is selected, then this content is selected. And then in your code, you just have like a one liner that says place whatever the input selected content is. Um, that should go here. So we'll over time, even some of the code that he's done today will will go away in favor of strategies that we can employ, you know, at the UI level. The other thing we can do with those inputs, just to show one more quick example, is I can have Hypar test out different combinations. So maybe, you know, I don't know which of these is going to yield the best results, but I can see a visualization of each of them and I can see what results it'll have for the count and the watts per square feet. So I can pick a different scenario based on different combinations of these inputs. And uh, Andrew, just uh, hit the sort by uh, down uh, down menu, and then you can see another right. way to quickly get to the right answer. Yeah. And I, I did mention in the chat, but I'll just say it out loud, especially for, I think maybe the chat doesn't come through to YouTube. Um, all of the source uh, for this will be made available on the Hypar Space repository. This whole project, everything, including how the zones are generated, as well as all of the furniture layout and all of those different space types, it's totally open source. You can go look right now and see how all of it works. And we'll just add a new data hall folder in there that includes the complete code for this example. Fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, well, everyone, thanks for coming uh, on Friday afternoon, Friday evening, for those of you who are coming from, from Europe. Um, I hope you all had learned a lot from Andrew today. And uh, we will, um, oh, we're going into our happy hour now. So uh, everyone at Hypar is gonna, gonna pour a drink and learn, from, learn about something cool in Eric's life. Uh, so that's gonna be, so uh, we will see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you uh, have specific topics that you want to talk about, that you want to learn about the Hypar platform, please reach out to us. Um, you know, we're all on Twitter. Uh, we're all, uh, uh, you know, reachable by email. By uh, all the, I, we should probably have a a I, I have the actual like structure for like how to reach us. But um, but we're out there. Please please come tell us what you want to do in the next one. Um, you know, we, we have lots of ideas, but we want to hear what you want to do as well. So thank you everyone for coming and we'll have, uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks everyone. Any, any last thoughts, Ian? No, I think it's a great idea. I love the idea of turning this into also a bit of a stump the chump. You know, if, uh, if people yes. out there who are listening can find, hey, I'm in infrastructure or I'm in whatever specialization within uh, the built environment, um, do you think that Hypar could be useful in this scenario? Uh, and, and see if we could, uh, I don't wanna throw it all on Andrew, but somebody on the team uh, will come on or a couple people on the team will come on and we see if we can solve those challenges in real time. Indeed, been great. Have a great weekend, everyone.